Welcome to Unfuck Your Brain, feminist self-help for everyone. Brought to you by the School of New Feminist Thought. I'm your host, Kara Lowenthal, Harvard lawyer turned life coach extraordinaire, and I'm here to help you get society's sexist messages out of your brain so you can be confident, feel powerful, and live a life you won't regret when you die. If you want to jumpstart that process, you need to grab my totally free guide to feeling less anxious and more empowered by rewiring your brain. Just text your email to plus one three four seven nine nine seven one seven eight four and use code word brain or go to unfuckyourbrain.com forward slash brain. Now let's get to today's episode. Hello, my chickens. So in a weird turn of events recently, well, maybe not weird or a turn of events, here's the thing I realized recently. I realized that, you know, so many people who come and join the Feminist Self-Help Society or even find and listen to the podcast are doing it because they feel anxious, right? Anxiety is one of the highest kind of keyword searches that leads people to us. So I think anxiety is like a big motivator of why we go look for help with our minds. So completely natural, it makes sense. And obviously, I talk quite a lot about anxiety in like a lot of different ways in bits and pieces here and there. But I realized I had not in a long time, if ever, really put together all of my work on anxiety and taught it in a way that everyone can start to use really actionably right away to understand what is going on in their brain when they feel anxiety, why it can be just so distressing and overwhelming, and how we can use feminist coaching tools to really help us reduce or eliminate our anxiety. And so it's really more than I can fit in a podcast, and I want to be able to share kind of visual aids and take questions and just do this all together in a more interactive format. So I'm teaching a free training called The Feminist Anxiety Fix this Sunday, March 17th at 1 p.m. And this really takes the kind of cutting edge, most advanced work I have on anxiety. I've been in the process of writing my book this whole year, which has really deepened my work in this area and kind of brought up and integrated and synthesized a lot of what I have been teaching in different pieces in different ways over the last few years into one kind of coherent overall, well, not that I was incoherent before, but (laughs) in one overall framework. All right, I'm a little punchy because I'm really excited about this training and I want you to come. So register for the Feminist Anxiety Fix, please, if you have any anxiety. And if you don't have any anxiety at all, then I would like you to come teach this class to the rest of us. We all have anxiety. It's a normal human emotion, but we can reduce it. And I think depending on who you are and the sources of your anxiety, you can see you know, a substantial to an almost all reduction. I mean, I am somebody who used to be anxious like every, I don't know, five minutes every day. And I really rarely feel anxious anymore still happens. I'm still a human, but I don't know, it's probably 2% of what it used to be. So I'm going to teach you what is causing your anxiety. I'm going to be really diving into what I really specialize in, which is socially programmed anxiety. So I'm going to teach you what that is and how to solve it in the Feminist Anxiety Fix. So text your email to plus one three four seven nine nine seven one seven eight four. That's plus one three four seven nine nine seven one seven eight four. And the code word is anxiety when you're asked for the code word, or just go to unfuckyourbrain.com forward slash anxiety. Cannot wait to teach all of you about the sources of your anxiety, about socially programmed anxiety specifically, and how to change it. I'll see you then. All right. Hello, my friends. I'm so excited for today's guest because I'm here to talk with Laura Gassner Odding, who is an expert in what I think is one of the defining mental clusterfucks of, you know, myself and everybody listens to this podcast, which is that nexus of the emotions we believe accomplishing things and success should bring to us. So I'm super excited to hear her perspective and share it with you. As we all know, I like women to brag about themselves. So Laura, can you tell us a little bit about, you've had an amazing and very varied career, different from the background of most executive coaches or authors, as have I. So I would love to hear kind of 
How did you get to where you are today? Sure. I Well, thank you for having me, first of all. I would say that my career has really four distinct moments. The first was dropping out of law school and joining a presidential campaign that landed me in the Clinton White House and helping build AmeriCorps. The second was going into doing executive search for one of the sort of biggest marquee firms in the country. And then having a crisis of maybe a moment of rage, I would say, where I realized I could do things better, smarter, faster than like the old white dudes running the place, which led to my third iteration of my career, which was opening my own executive search firm. So yes, executive search for 20 years, but the second, the 15 years of it were actually as an entrepreneur, as a founder running my own thing. And so I sort of think of those as two very distinct, the doing and the leading are sort of very different jobs. And then I sold that firm to the women who helped me found it. And that's when I had a crisis of identity where I was like, who am I when I'm no longer LGO, CEO, here's my business card. And I started a blog, which was under the very clever name, lauragassnerodding.com, because I'm a marketing genius. And I started writing about things that pissed me off in the world. And somebody from TEDx Cambridge saw one of those blog posts and asked me if I would do a TEDx talk. And my first response was, no fucking way. I don't want to speak in public. That's terrifying. I've never spoken in public. I don't want to do it. No, thank you. My kids are in the backseat. And they're like, mom, don't you tell us we have to do things that scare us? And I was like, ah, oh, man, like you don't <laughs> tell me to, you don't listen to me when I tell you to pick up your dirty socks, but right. that's that you grokked. Okay, cool. Six weeks later, I'm on the stage. I give a talk. That talk gets some attention. I get an offer to go fly to Boise, Idaho to speak for $1,500. And little did I know it, a hat with a potato on it because it was Idaho. And I was like, well, this is interesting. You're going to pay me to talk? Cool. I started to notice that all the people who were getting paid real big money had books. So I was like, I better get me one of them, which brings me to the fourth iteration (laughs) of my career, which is as now I spend my time as an author and a keynote speaker. So that's who I am. Amazing. I feel like the only thing that could be better in that story is if you were wearing the potato hat while you were telling it, because that really feels like a piece of local color. That's now, I'm putting that on my bucket list. If I were like, and I was wearing this here potato hat. And then I, I this pull it out potato to hat. Now that I would want, be amazing. Now I want a potato hat. That would be amazing, amazing. potato hat. Yeah. I mean, I could sit here and be like, you know, that, you know, I've now done another TEDx and that's got almost 2 million views and I got a Wall Street Journal bestseller and blah, 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 blah. But you know, I don't know. I think what's more interesting than the achievement is the journey that we take towards the achievement. So yeah, I guess the assignment was for me to brag about myself, but I think I told you more about the journey because I think that we're all in the journey. I love that though. I mean, and the journey is, I mean, bragging or not, like that sort of path you went on, I think is so obviously important where you are, but I also love it because one of the things that I see so much in my like followers and listeners and students, and I was like this too, is sort of how early on we get this thought pattern of like, well, this is what I'm doing. So like, I have to be doing that, right? It's like too late to change. I should have majored in something else. I should have gone to a different graduate school. I should have gone to graduate school. I should have not gone to graduate school. I should have picked a different career, right? And like, I think, you know, your journey showing like you can really, I mean, I almost dropped out of law school too. My parents convinced me to stay. (laughs) So maybe the lesson is you could just, I could have skipped a lot of my process by just dropping out in the beginning and doing something else. But that like, Having those different phases of your career, I just feel like even that before we get to like succeeding in them is just important to talk about because people get so stuck in like, I made one wrong choice when I was 18 and now whatever I'm doing, being a horse trainer or an accountant or whatever for the rest of my life. Yeah, absolutely. So we should talk about choices, making choices and whether or not there actually are any bad choices. We should talk about that because when I was writing Wonder Hell, my latest book, I came across a study that said that people who are paralyzed by a decision and they can't decide, should I do it? Should I not do it? If they flip a coin and the coin says heads do it versus tails don't do it, it turns out that if they're asked six months later, if that was the right choice or the wrong choice, they'll say, actually, after a couple months, they're probably no worse off. And after six months or longer, most of them will say they're actually better off for going for it even if they say that it was the wrong choice. And I think that's so fascinating because it means that there are really, I mean, obviously there's some very bad choices, right? Like drinking a bottle (laughs) of gin and getting behind the wheel of the car. 
Very bad choice, right? Like marrying somebody who abuses you, very bad choice. But there are, for the most part, when we decide, should I take the job? Should I buy the house? Should I go on the trip? If we move forward with the thing, even if in the end we're like, yeah, that was the wrong choice, we always talk about the lessons we learned along the way, the adventures that we had, the opportunities that we were introduced to. Like there are so many moments in our lives, these sliding door moments where we wouldn't have the things that we have if we just stayed home, right? So this sort of action beating stagnation, I think is just sort of a fascinating question. Should you have dropped out? Should I have stayed in law school? I don't know, right? Like there's no way to know because you don't get a control group on your life. But I love this idea that like failure is never finale. It's just fulcrum. It just teaches us that there are other options that are out there. Yeah, and you get a chance to then make another decision. This is like one of the things I have to talk about. Like if you don't make any decision, then at the end of six months, you have made zero decisions. I mean, that is sort of a decision, but you're still where you are, right? Whereas make a decision, even if you're like, oh, turns out I don't like living on a cruise ship or like whatever you've decided. Now you have an opportunity to make another decision. You're going to, by the end of six months, you can have made so many more decisions that moved things forward, like in your life, in your business, whatever it is. Yeah. And you know, here's the thing, that decision may be, I'm going to do nothing for three months and just gather more information, but it can't be, I'm going to do nothing. Right. Like it has to be sort of time limited. There has to be a reason to do it. But I, you know, I think to go back to something that you also said when you were responding to my journey, we always do things so that we can, right? Like I'm going to study for this test so that I get a good grade. I'm going to get good grades so I can get into college. I want to get into the right college so I can get the right internship. I want to get the right internship so I can get the right job. There's always a so that we can, what's next. And then, you know, you get into sort of your late twenties or early thirties, Maybe you get married, maybe you have kids, but you're like at this point in your life where you're like, okay, I've now done all the things that I want to do so that I can do the next thing. And then you look around and you're like, okay, so I've now filled all the boxes on the checklist. Why do I still feel so empty? And it's because we spend so much time in this so that I can, so that I can do the next thing. And this to me, it came in sort of this crashing moment for me in the, the the middle of the pandemic. So like a lot of people during the pandemic, I just kind of stopped sleeping, right? Like, you know, the stress of like, I make my living as a keynote speaker. So there's no planes, there's no events, there's no stages, there's no keynote speaking, right? I have to rebuild my entire business as a virtual person. How do I do it? At the same time, my husband is losing his mind because he's trying to deal with his own business. I've got two kids that are applying to college and that are dealing with like the early days of high school. So I've got like trying to keep them saying, and who takes it all, right? Like mom, like I have got to deal with all of it. And so the stress of it, I just stopped sleeping. And I've never been to therapy in my life. Not that I'm against it. I just had never felt the need for it. And all of a sudden I felt the need for it. And so I walked into the psychiatrist's office and I sit down and within like two minutes, he diagnoses me as being absolutely, completely, totally boring. Like he was like, there is nothing wrong with you. You are just an overachiever who can no longer overachieve. You're a perfectionist who can no longer be perfect, right? And I was like, okay, great. He goes, well, we can work on that if you want. And I was like, what do you mean? Perfectionism, overachievement? You're like, this like, sounds great. Why would I want to change it? That's of this? a feature, not a bug. Right. I was like, what, what are you talking about? And he's like, yes, but it's untenable. And I was like, yeah, no, doc, I think it's fine. And then he countered with the biggest checkmate of all, which was this, but you're here. <laughs> I mm, was like- I loved it. I love to say that when someone's like says no to everything I say in coaching, I'm like, great, you came to coaching. Yes. So what were you hoping would happen? Exactly. And then so then this doctor looks at me after he just like gave me the biggest checkmate of all, and he just basically blows the entire board up and he goes, You know, Laura, you don't have to give the trophies back. And I was like, Whoa, what? You don't have to give the trophies back. Everything you've ever achieved up until this point still belongs to you. Right. You still have this award and that, you know, access and this network and these, you still have all the things, even if you're not constantly going for them all every single moment of every single day. And I was just like, wait a minute. What? Like it made me start thinking about like, what if we aren't doing all the things so that we can? What if we just enjoyed the journey part of it and got sort of really comfortable being in this uncomfortable space in the middle as opposed to always racing to get to the finish line. Yeah, I think that's so crucial because when you're achieving things for a fleeting sense of confidence 
or self-esteem or safety or whatever it is, right? That's why there's no end to it and everything you've done before doesn't count anymore, right? I mean, it's really like as a, you know, former achievement junkie myself, like you could look at my life now and be like, is it former really? Like as somebody who is very goal motivated and goes after those things, but still it's, I mean, it's like a high, it's like an addiction, right? It's sort of like, it feels good when you get it for a minute. Really, it feels good when you see you're going to get it before you actually got it. When you get it, it often feels anticlimactic. Sometimes it doesn't even feel good. Sometimes it just feels like relief. Like when when my book launched and I hit the Wall Street Journal list, people were like, are you happy? Was it great? And I'm like, I'm just kind of relieved that the work right, works. That I'm not going to have to beat myself up. Right. And like, I'm relieved of all the shame I anticipated having if it didn't work. Correct. So I feel like what you're saying is so important. And I think everybody listening to this who is a little bit of an achievement junkie should, I'm not trying to be stigmatizing to drug users, whatever word we want to use, like an achievement pursuer. It is fascinating to ask yourself like, okay, especially once you're in your like 30s, 40s, 50s, like, Okay, I achieved all these things. Every single one of them, I told myself I was going to finally feel good about myself when I achieved it. Now I have the whole list. What's the point of the next one, right? It just like shows you how much you are not actually achieving things for their own sake or because they're going to give you any lasting sense of confidence. It's just you need another hit. You need the next source. Yes. You need the next, you got to tie it to the next thing. Yes, yes. And you know, some of that comes from evolution, right? I mean, like we've evolved over thousands of millennia to be constantly pursuing better and more and different and right innovation. Like that's baked into our DNA. It's it's why we exist. It's why we're still alive, right? So like some of it, you got it. Sorry, right? Like I, I love to travel. I'm never as happy as I am when I've got a boarding pass in one hand and a and a passport in the other. And like the weirder the departure board looks, the better. Like the the stranger <laughs> the languages, the city names, the better. Like I just love it. And my my younger son has this wanderlust also. And I'm like, sorry, kid, it's fatal. Like it's in your DNA. You're right. gonna have it until you die. Like it's just it, it is what it is. I think if you are an achievement pursuer, a junkie, an addict, whatever we want to yeah. call it, <laughs> I think. It's who you are. And I think we can try to fight against it, but it's just who you are. Like, I mean, to actually take people who have addiction issues for a moment, the Venn diagram of people who are recovering addicts and people who are like long distance runners, like runners, like yeah. endurance, like 50 mile races, 100 mile, like it is a huge, like there is a huge overlap between former addicts, like people recovering addicts and people who just run for days at a time because you are constantly pursuing that next high. And it's never going to be as good as the first one, right? But you're constantly pursuing the next one. You're always chasing that first high again is what they say. And so I think it's the same way. You know, like when my first book came out, it hit the Washington Post list. And I was like, that's cool. If I'm ever going to write another one, I'm only going to do it if I think I can hit the Wall Street Journal. And now I'm like, if I'm ever going to write a third, I'm only going to do it if I can hit the New York Times, right? Because why do it if you're just going to do the same thing again? But there has to be a reason. So for me, hitting the Wall Street Journal list gives me a bump in my speaking fee, which gets me on bigger stages and it gets me bigger media. So there's a reason, but it's still the like, so that I can. Right. It's always the so that I can. And a couple of days ago, I had somebody ask me what success meant to me personally, since I spent all my time talking about, you know, success and happiness. And I said, you know, I think we all have two numbers. We have the need to make number and the want to make number, right? The need to make numbers, like you gotta, you know, what you need to like put food on the table and pay your mortgage and pay for your kid's school and healthcare, like all the stuff we have to, we, like you need to pay for. And then, Somewhere floating above that is the want to make number. Like, how many vacations do you want to go on this year? Where do you want to stay on those vacations? What kind of car do you want to drive? Do you want to give back to charity? Like, what's all the extra? What does that cost? And what I said was somewhere between the need to make number and the want to make number is a whole lot of work. And I consider myself successful if the work that I'm doing in between the need to make and the want to make number is based on curiosity and interest and joy and delight and not just my own ego. Yeah, there's like a lot to unpack there. I want to back up to the sort of the it's baked in part because I think there's so many factors, right? There's evolutionary biology, there might be genetics, there's how you were raised and what your family expectations were. And then there's also there's generational trauma. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Right. Like, and like, what kind of mentors or teachers did Mm -hmm. you have? And like, right, so many things impact this. What's your birth order? And then there's the socialization that women get. And I think part of what you're talking about that's so important is that it's not that there's anything wrong with 
being achievement oriented, wanting to achieve, setting big goals. I mean, this is something like I teach and coach about how to do all the time. The problem is when you've got your sort of ability to exist with yourself, right, all wrapped up in it. So that, you know, if you miss the bestseller list, for instance, what is your reaction? When your reaction is, you're so fucking stupid, you did it wrong, I can't believe you failed, this is so embarrassing, right? Like, that's the problem. Yes. Thinking about it as baked in from whatever amount of factors, I think one, like, I usually shy away from sort of deterministic ways of thinking about things. But I think that one benefit of it might be that a lot of the objection that I get from kind of high powered people or people who've achieved a lot is like, well, if I start being nice to myself, then I will lie on the couch and not do anything ever again. Right. Like the idea is like criticizing myself has driven me. And like, I hear this all the time and I'm always like trying to share my example of like, that's not what happened to me. Like, But I, if you think about it as like, if you are somebody who's very achievement oriented, you probably are still going to have that. Like changing your self-talk or not beating yourself up or not trying to drive yourself with shame is not going to excise that out of your personality. Right, you're, you're not going to have your personality transplant because you decided to not say you were a stupid bitch in the mirror every right. morning. Like, it just doesn't happen. <laughs> right. You're still going to be, if you are someone who likes to set goals and achieve them, that you're still going to have that. But it just might be a little, it's going to be more pleasant. Yes, and in yes. my experience, you can actually, it's, it's what you're describing between the like, have to make, want to make, like, whether you're talking about it in financial terms or just in terms of thinking about like, what kind of goals would you come up with and how would you achieve them if you had freed your brain from the down drag of like, you're doing it wrong, you're stupid, you have to do what everybody else does, you know, define success. So I know you talk a lot about how are we going to define and determine success? And I, I'm curious what your advice is as somebody who has gone through the process of kind of disconnecting your vision of success from maybe like dropping out of law school even, right? Like you obviously went on to have a mainstream prestigious career in some ways, but you still took that the step of being like, oh, I'm going to like let go of that safe path that I'm supposed to be on. What do you think was the mindset that kind of allowed you to do that? I think it was like organ rejection failure really was what it was. <laughs> like, you know, when you're in those moments when you're like, I don't know where I should go or what I should do, but I know I can't stay here. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, the only way I can describe it is it's like when you've like eaten like a piece of bad shellfish and it just needs to come out no matter what. Like I could very easily tell the story differently and say, well, I was in law school and I heard this man give this speech and I had a vision that he would become president. And so I decided to start volunteering. I met the most important people and I ended up uh -huh. working. No, I dropped out. I got coffee with the guy who got coffee for the guy who got coffee because I was in law school and I was basically failing out and I was dating the world's worst boyfriend. And that guy had exceptional taste in precisely two things. Obviously, the first being girlfriends, Obviously. clearly. And the second being unknown presidential hopefuls from tiny Southern states. And I was like, Governor who from Arkansas? Not a chance in hell. Like George H.W. Bush had just, quote unquote, one desert storm. He had a 91 percent approval rating and the Democrats are running a sacrificial lamb. And then I heard Bill Clinton talk about this idea of community service in exchange for college tuition. And I was like, whoa, that's an interesting idea. And all four principals, Bill and Hill and Alan Tipper, were coming to Gainesville, nowhere, Florida, about three weeks later. So I started volunteering on the campaign just because I was not studying at all. And um, <laughs> and we got 36,000 people to show up at a rally. And the national office was like, who are those volunteers? We should hire them. Now, hire them means we'll pay them all the cold pizza they want to eat and they can sleep on a campaign bus. And I was like, well, I can't stay here, so I might as well go there, right? So like, I'd love to say that I had this epiphany, I had this drive, I had this way to see the world. But I think the truth is a lot of times people who do things that are outside of the norm do it because they're just failing in the norm or like either they're failing the norm or the norm is failing them, right? But they're just, it's not working. And so they figure out a way to survive outside of it. And so that's what I did. And I think because of that moment, it's funny, I've never been asked this question this way, but I think because of that moment, I was just introduced to this, like, I don't know, what if it works kind of mentality. And I think a lot of times we worry about like, what's the worst thing that can happen? And so many, like, I give a lot of talks now to groups of entrepreneurs or entrepreneur wannabes. And they'll ask me at some point, like, how long did it take you to write the business plan for your search firm? And I'm like, you got a napkin? I'll write it now. <laughs> like, I get that too. And I'm like, the business plan was coaching costs X. Right. 
I want to make X. I need this many clients. Exactly. It's not a natural. Exactly. I was like, I had this total moment of rage and I literally had this idea, as I mentioned, that I could do this work faster, better, smarter, with more authenticity, more integrity, better for my clients, better for me than these dudes. And I walked into their office and I was like, there's a better way. And they were like, there's the door. Right. So, <laughs> I mean, I'd love to say that like I could write the story and tell you that it was all this fancy polished thing, but I think that does a disservice to other women. I want to tell the story as real and as messy as it was, which was in this moment, I was faced with this, okay, you've now determined that the way that our search firm works is that it is not solving our client's problems, right? We're not the solution, which left me in only one place, which is that I realized that I, if I wasn't their solution, I was their problem. And that to me was untenable. I couldn't stay. I had to go. And so I left. I had 24 hours of labor in an unplanned C-section. And six weeks later, I got a phone call from somebody that I'd worked with in the White House who was like, I heard you had a baby. Ew. I mean, cool, I guess. Mm-hmm. Like, ooh, wow. Are you still doing search? Our executive director just resigned. And I was like, um, yes. And she was like, great. What do you charge? And I was like, a uh, hundred dollars an hour. And she was like, terrific. Send me a contract. And literally, baby in one hand, I'm like six weeks past an emergency C section. I can barely walk to the bathroom by myself. One handed, I'm like clicking on my laptop how to write a professional services contract. <laughs> Google, like search. But everything you're describing is like, even if you're failing out of law school or the system is failing, like whether you're failing or the system's failing. There's this like resourcefulness and this like, I'm just going to try something, right? Like, so for anybody listening who's like, I am, whatever, I'm failing out of school or I feel like I'm, my boss hates me and I'm not going to get ahead or I'm getting poor performance reviews at work or whatever, right? Like what you're describing is, okay, it wasn't like a moment of revelation, but it was a moment of resourcefulness, right? A moment of like, I'm going to do something. Like the story wasn't like, I dropped out of law school and then I like moved home with my parents and beat myself up for two years and then yeah. started delivering papers or whatever. I mean, I, I refuse to lay down and die, right? Like that's just, that's- That's huge though. Huge. I really think that's an under, that is an underrated- Yeah, I mean, okay, so like, you know, I mean, wow. to make this very literal, in 2021, I got so sick with a super rare autoimmune disease that I didn't know if I was going to see 2022. Like super rare, 800 people in a country of what, what are we- 300 million people have ever been diagnosed with this disease. I'm fine now. I'm in remission. People shouldn't worry about me. But in this moment, I walked into my doctor's office and I was like, I've got what? 800 people? Like, I'm sorry. I'm special, but I'm not that special. (laughs) And he was like, well, according to the 32 blood tests, the four biopsies and the one chest x-ray you've had, it would appear that you are. And he said, look, we've got two ways to do this. And both of them are like off label. We can either give you this one medication, which will sort of keep you where you are, which is stable, but you know, you're not happy, right? And you know, trigger warning, suicidal thoughts here. I spent hours for months while they didn't know what was going on with me, like in the middle of the night Googling, trying to figure out what the all these symptoms were and like making mental lists of the videos I should make for my kids because I didn't think I was going to be there for their most important moments in their lives, right? So it was it was bad. Very heavy. Yeah. So number one, we could just keep you where you are. Well, that's not a good option. Or number two, we'll give you this other biologic, this chemotherapy infusion biologic, and there's a 40% chance of stroke and a 20% chance of death. And I was like, can I have the IV in my arm right now? So I think there are moments in your life where you are backed against a wall and you just say, anything is better than where I am now. And then there are moments in your life where you're like, okay, I have some choices. Some of them are more dramatic than others. Some of them are easier than others. Some of them, the failure might be worse to recover from, right, than what's going on. But I think every one of us at every point in our lives, except for the one big thing at the end, right, like we have choices. There's always options. And a lot of times it starts with refusing to roll over and die, literally, physically, you know, metaphorically. And refusing to see yourself as helpless and having no agency. Like I think this is something I coach on all the time because people think that mindset work and coaching is like, fluffy and for privilege, you know, like that it's sort of this like, just for people who's like hardest choices, should I go to Pilates or yoga, right? And in fact, like mindset and taking, so I talk a lot about Victor Frankl, the mm-hmm. Holocaust yeah, survivor, yeah. Wrote Man's Man's Church, meaning, right? Right. because right. that's the power of it is like when you don't like any of your options, when your options are like, my boss is sexually harassing me and I need this job and I have to figure out what to do. 
And all these options are scary and have some risk, right? Am I going to have an internal soundtrack that is like, I'm helpless. I can't figure this out. I don't have any options. I have to suffer through this, right? Or am I going to have a mental soundtrack that is, I can figure this out. Yeah. Like, I'm never completely helpless. Like, I'm constantly coaching on the idea that, like, I don't like any of my options is very different right. than I don't have any options. Right. And, you know, I so, okay, I can also imagine that there are people who are listening who are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I don't have any options. And what I'll say is, I don't know if you play video games. I don't play video games. If you're a listener and you play video games, you'll know what I'm talking about. But I have two sons. They're 19 and 21 now. So I had teenage boys in the house for a long time. So there were a lot of video games. And I remember waking up one day and I had a terrible night of sleep and I was driving my kid to school. I drove him to the dentist. We were like driving alone, like in the middle of the morning. And I was just still grousing about having a bad night of sleep. And I, I had a chapter due to my publisher that day. And I just, my brain was like oozing out of my left ear. Like it just, I wasn't going to get anything written. And he looked at me and he's like, I don't understand what the problem is. Just go on a side quest today. And I was like, what's a side quest? And he said, well, you know, like at night, if I get the dishes done and I want to go play video games, my friend Kyle hasn't gotten his dishes done yet. So I'm like waiting around to play whatever Worlds of Warcraft or whatever video game they're playing. He's like, I'm sitting around waiting. He's like, if the plan of the game, like goal of the game is to go to the castle, slay the dragon and save the princess. If I'm waiting for him to sign on, well, I'm a farmer, so I'm tilling my wheat. And then I take my wheat to the market and I sell my wheat at the market for money. And with the money, I can buy swords and potions and a horse. And I'm like, okay. And he goes, so then when Kyle finally finishes the dishes and logs on, I'm ready to get on my horse with my potions and my sword to go to the castle, slay the dragon and save the princess. And I was like, okay, first of all, I hate that you're learning that you get to save the princess because the princess is going to save her own damn self. Second of all, that's really interesting. So I started thinking about this concept of side quest. So even in these moments when you're like, my boss is sexually harassing me, but I have to make rent and I can't get another job right now, right? Like there are things that we can all be doing. Like you can do informational interviews. You can listen to podcasts like this. You could read books like mine and your book that's coming out. You can watch TED Talks. You can go to networking events. Like there's so many things that we can do. We have so much agency, even if it's not the big thing, right? Even if it's not the big thing that you want to change, there's all these little side quests so that when you finally finish the dishes and can get on the horse and pick up your sword, you can save your own self. And, you know, there's science actually behind this about making your own luck. Like people aren't just born lucky or unlucky. There's actually science that says that if you put yourself out there, if you act like a lucky person, I am a raging introvert. I could talk to you all day, but you put me in a room with 10 people and I'll curl up in fetal position. Talk to a thousand, easy, because I'm like making love to the lights. But yeah. It's performing versus having to It's performing, exactly. But if you act like an extroverted person acts, if you make connections, if you have conversations, if you put yourself in the way of luck, you become a luckier person. And so it's the same thing. We can do all these side quests, even if we feel like we have no agency right now to do the big thing. We have tons of agency to prepare ourselves by doing the little things so that when the big opportunity comes along, boom, there we are, we're ready. Yeah, it's like such a different question to say to you. Like the first instance, you're not even asking yourself a question. You're just saying, I don't have any options, right? When you ask yourself a question like, what options might I have? Or like, what are the small things I can do? What are the small side quests I can see, right? Like I see this constantly in coaching that someone will tell you they have no options. And when you get them to like try to think something little, in this instance, it might be like, oh, well, I could see about switching to that other project for now, right? To like, whatever, get away from this guy while I, or woman, whoever's harassing you, while I do the informational interviews or while I network, or maybe I could start the side hustle or I could think about, you know, my best friend called me three weeks ago and said, she really wanted me to come work for her. And I thought I should, mm-hmm. there's like so much around you, right? And the, the science of what is the name? Not cognitive bias, but, but you see what you're looking for, yes. right? The sort of, so when you tell yourself you have no options, all your brain searches for, your brain is just like control F, control F. All it's looking for is like all the ways you don't have options. And when you tell yourself, I have agency, I have options, your brain will be looking for it. It's actually how manifestation works. I thought manifestation was total bullshit. Like it's total bullshit that some like hippy dippy chick and boho chic flower crown looking out over Coachella talks about whatever. And then I started reading about it. Cause I was like, all right, I, I want to, I want to learn more. And it turns out that you do see what you're looking for. That's exactly what it is. And so our brain takes in 11 million bits of data every single second of every single day, 11 million bits, right? And we know the five senses like touch, smell, hearing, et cetera. 
But also there's like proprioception, like how's your body moving through space and thermoception, like is it warm, is it hot? And so there's so many, there's like 53 different senses and it can only pick up 50. Like it takes an 11 million, you can only pick up 50. So you have all these people who are like, I wanted to go to Japan. So I put a picture of pagoda and I wrote Japan and swirly font on my vision board. And then a bus went by with a sail half off flights to Japan, I manifested it. And I'm like, you don't manifest that. Right, you, you just see it yes, now. Yes, like, it's not like, oh, I thought about it one day, so it happened. Like, you intentionally, right. you thought about it, you put on your vision board, you see it every single day. So you train your brain that when the bus goes by, it picks that one piece up. You didn't manifest the bus, but you told your brain to like, oh, instead of seeing the billboard about the sign for, you know, the Celtics playing next week, you see right. the billboard for the sale to right. Japan. And I just, I think that's so interesting. And it makes me realize that, you know, when you are in this space and you're feeling negative, right? And you're looking at yourself saying you're stupid in the mirror. I think one of the best things you can do is surround yourself with people who not just see who you are right now, but who can see your future. Like, I think we surround ourselves with a lot of people who see either our present or our past. They remember who we are. They remember the mistakes we made. But there's studies that show that if you say, I smoke, you are more likely to quit smoking than if you say, I am a smoker. Like one is a right. habit and one is right. identity. One's identity. So like if yeah. somebody sees you smoke, they don't know if you're a smoker or maybe you're just having a cigarette. So somebody who can see your future will help you become that person, even if sometimes you can't see it yourself, right? I mean, I'm sure you do this with your coaching clients. You probably see their greatness even more than they see it sometimes. And sometimes just your reflecting their greatness back on them gives them the courage to actually believe it and maybe act upon it. Yeah. I think that's a huge part of like any one-to-one -one therapy or coaching. That Having that community is one of the reasons that I think is so important for those of you listening to this who are not in the Feminist Self-Help Society. Like Most of the people in your life you may be surrounded by people who read self-development books and who are trying to improve their their situation and their thoughts. But if you're not, having those conversations, having those people around you does provide that like people who can help you hold that vision of yourself is so important. And I totally, I mean, anybody who's listened to this podcast for a while have heard me talk ad nauseum about the idea that like manifesting quote unquote is just the coaching model that we teach, which is like, if you think a certain way, you feel a certain way, you act a certain way, you create that outcome, right? It's mm -hmm. like, you believe you're going to meet a partner, then you go out and speak to a bunch of people and you go on a bunch of dates. Yeah, you quote unquote manifested it, but manifestation isn't like you sit in your apartment alone and you just think about a partner and then like it turns out to be the UPS guy. <laughs> or I manifested my perfect spouse out exactly. of thin air, right? It's like, no, that's Frankenstein. That's like <laughs> Frankenstein's monster, rather. Yeah. Well, he's misunderstood. He's misunderstood. So, Every, everyone likes a gentle, <laughs> a, a gentle giant. <laughs> I just have, we have to love him for Mary Shelley writing the first science fiction book as like a 19 year old girl. Absolutely. So good. Speaking of books, tell us where people can find your book and what they will get from reading it. Yeah. Wonder so, Hell, which I love as a title. Yeah. My, my latest book is called Wonder Hell. And it's all about this moment where you've achieved something that you didn't think you could achieve. You weren't quite so sure. And then you did. And you're like, that's amazing. It's exciting. It's wonderful. And also in this moment of achieving it, I saw a vision of myself that I didn't know was possible. And now I'm excited to see what I can do next, but I'm also filled with anxiety and uncertainty and doubt and envy and exhaustion and burnout. It's wonderful, <laughs> but it's also kind of hell. It's kind of well, wonder hell. To, can't wait. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and well, so wonder hell is the space where the burden of your potential walks in and is like, hey there. What you got for me? What are you going to do with this newfound you that you didn't know existed last week, last month, last year? And so when I found myself in Wonder Hell, I went about interviewing a hundred different glass ceiling shatterers, Olympic medalists, startup unicorns to figure out how on earth to survive in this moment. And what I learned is that we don't survive these moments. We just learn how to thrive in them because the underside of this Wonder Hell is just the next one and the next one and the next one after that. So Wonder Hell why success doesn't feel like it should and what to do about it talks about why success doesn't feel like it should and what we can all do about it. I love it. So everybody should go order this book. Should people order wherever they order? Should they Anywhere order? they order books is Anywhere great. you order from. Because I think that like paradoxically realizing that the next achievement is not going to be what makes me feel good about myself forever has freed me up to achieve so much more. Like creating this business and having a podcast with 40 million downloads, having the book deal, all of these things only came from me being like, oh, I'll still probably feel like shit 50% of the time, but it's worth doing anyway, right? When you have all of your future hopes for your happiness pinned on the achievement, 
then that's what holds you back. So absolutely. I love, the achievement love is fleeting. I do, I should say for all of your listeners, yes, you can buy this book anywhere you buy your books because I am out of the book launch window. But anybody who is buying your upcoming book needs to be very specific <laughs> about where you want them to buy it because the way that you hit a bestseller list, which is so important for us women, right? We need to have the O oh, and she's A because that yeah. is what makes the men go, oh, we should actually pay her real money, right? So you can buy my book anywhere that you buy your books, but Kara, I'm sure that you have a very specific time and window and place that you want people to buy your book. So <laughs> yes, I don't want to people, confuse that for people no, that are excited I, to support good, you. That's a good point. If it's before May 21st, 2024, you should get my book at takebackyourbrainbook.com. All right. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with us and your story. Well, thank you so much for having me. If you're loving what you're learning on the podcast, you have got to come check out the Feminist Self-Help Society. It's our newly revamped community and classroom where you get individual help to better apply these concepts to your life, along with a library of next level, blow your mind coaching tools and concepts that I just can't fit in a podcast episode. It's also where you can hang out, get coached and nerd out about all things thought work and feminist mindset with other podcast listeners just like you and me. It's my favorite place on earth and it will change your life. I guarantee it. Come join us at www.unfuckyourbrain.com forward slash society. I can't wait to see you there.